I just want to start off by saying how unfair it is that I have to follow up Joel because I've gotten to see Joel's faith journey in action. I know her story about when she was kind of on and off with youth group and a small group, one of our LifePoint small group leaders reaching out to her, having her come back to be more consistent. I've seen her faith grow to the point where she chose to serve on one of our youth teams called our cafe team. And then I saw her grow in her faith and serve so well that she got invited on our student leadership team and then you know, keep growing in her faith and serve so well. We asked her to be what we call a student lead, where she gets to reach out to her peers and schedule people and lead huddles and, and be a part of our team that welcomes new students and into our lobby to, that ultimately allows them to possibly deepen their faith as well. I got to see Joelle come back and say, like, Matt, I really want to be a small group leader. And so we made an exception for her. And she, I've, I've just seen her just absolutely crush it as a small group leader. And then up to this year, already having a lump in my throat because she's been an intern with me this year. And seeing her and our other intern, Evan, do weekly Bible studies, hangouts, keeping just this active, thriving ministry going, allowing some of our youth team to take a deep breath and get ready. So I just think it's unfair that I already have a lump in my throat. And Joelle, I got to watch her do that. I know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Give it up for Joelle. I love it. Yes. Trust me, that is about the most support they get. It's not as much financially. So be sure to give her uh, a pat on the back. But I know it's been said before, but James really is one of my favorite books of the Bible. And I want to tell you why. One, one of the reasons why it's one of my favorite books of the Bible, and this has been said before, is that James is the half-brother of Jesus. Yes, I said half-brother, big scandal then, still talked about today. (laughs) But knowing that I'm close with my brothers, I have an older brother, a younger brother, and a younger sister— Knowing how close I am with my brothers, I could not imagine one of my brothers coming to me and being like, hey, Matt, by the way, I just want to let you know I am the son of God, right? My response would be something, you're the son of something, right? I think the word you're looking for is spawn, but anyways, but I think it's just, I love this book of the Bible because I truly believe that Jesus, when he prophesied, he said, hey, I'm going to die. I'm going to be buried for three days and then I'm going to raise again. And then he did it. Not only did his friends, his followers, but his own family couldn't deny that as well. And I just love that aspect of hearing James talk about a family member like this, knowing that he really was the son of God. The other reason why I love James is I I don't know this for 100% fact, but I'm pretty sure he's a second child. And I'm a second child. And second children are able to just speak truth in just like a weird, harsh way, right? They're just able to to get to it and say, hey, you're making this way too complicated. Let me just tell you what's going on. Like I have a second child. Her name is Kinsley. And she just has a way of coming in one day and I'm laying on the couch. She goes, dad, what happened to all your muscles? And I'm just like... (laughs) Oh, second children are great, Uh, that kind of thing. So I feel like I can relate to James as the type that's just going to kind of get us going. I think that it's wonderful whenever you can get into Scripture and just say, hey, it's actually maybe not as complicated as we make it. And, And as he has laid out what we've done in our series, how faith works, how he's just laid it out in a way that we can really compare and contrast our own life to what he's saying. Uh, I love how right now, as we are doing these series, we are really taking our time to go through it section by section, because the point isn't just to read the whole Bible in the year. The point isn't just to go through the Bible. The point is for the Bible to go through us, to impact our life, to, to cause us to stop and think about what does this mean for me and where I'm at and the relationships that I'm in and the community that I'm around. And I think that as whether that takes one verse or one section or one chapter or one book, it's just so good to know that as we get into chapter three, we are going to take this time to pause and see what this means for our life. James does a wonderful job of leading us through what I think, I'd like to summarize kind of what a, one of the commentaries that I used to kind of get ready for today. This is how the commentaries summarize kind of how far we've come, starting verse through chapters one, two, and three. This is what the commentary said. It said, a devoted follower of Jesus should stand confidently. And then we begin to chapter one, says serve compassionately. Chapter two, we dived into speak carefully. And then as I wrap up the end of chapter three, I think this is what James was trying to get across to us. He says, a devoted follower of Jesus should be what God wants them to be, do what God wants them to do, and speak as God wants them to speak. 
And we're going to summarize that. I'm going to wrap that point up. But James is going to continue to use the same rhythm he's been using along the way. He's going to compare and contrast two different ideas. So we'll have a very clear idea of what one idea looks like versus the other idea. He asks very probing questions that are actually rhetorical that well, it's going to allow us just to stop and think and ponder of what that looks like for our life. So today, as I wrap up chapter three and introduce us to chapter four, we're going to see how faith works through a comparison of two kinds of wisdom. Faith works through godly wisdom over worldly wisdom. This is what we're going to be diving into. And by the end of this, we're going to have a very clear idea of what to kind of mirror our life up to, to see if we're using worldly wisdom versus godly wisdom. So let's jump into this in James chapter 3, starting in verse 13. And he's going to start with a very, uh, one of the, once again, one of those probing questions that's going to get us just to pause for a second and think about where we stand in this question. It says this, who is wise in understanding among you? Now, imagine if you walked in today and I had a microphone up here and I just said, hey, LifePoint Church, who's wise in understanding among you? And I want you to come up and make a case for that person, a part of our church family. If I had a microphone and said, hey, truly, when you're walking in, hey, who's wise in understanding among you? Come up and, and make a case for them. This is what James is going to say that you need to do in order to make a case for that person. He says, let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. So basically saying the original show and tell. If you're going to come up to this microphone and try to tell us who is wise and understanding amongst us in our church, make sure that you can follow this up with their life. But it has to be in a humble way. Look, we all know someone who can win any trivia contest, but not have any ounce of wisdom at all, Right? We all know someone who should be more mature than us, but brings more drama than anybody else at all. We've all met someone who probably knows scripture, theology, and understanding of the gospel better than us, but yet cannot say it in a way that people actually want to be a part of it at all either, right? And that's where he's saying it has to be done in a humble way where people understand God. One of the, that same commentary put it this way. He said, they said, wisdom is not measured by degrees, but by deeds. It's not a matter of acquiring truth in lectures, but applying truth to life. The good life and deeds are best portrayed in the humility of wisdom or wise meekness. The truly wise person is humble. And that is why I'm so excited to compare and contrast what it means to be humble and how James is the one who has chosen to kind of give us these two lists. So we're going to dive into this second child honesty, right? Kind of like my second child, Kinsley, when she met her great-great-grandma, we said, hey, this is your great-grandma. She goes, no, she's just the old, old grandma, <laughs> right? So just buckle up and be prepared because we're going to laugh a little <laughs> and go there. James chapter 3, verse 14 but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. So the first part of worldly wisdom is bitter envy and selfish ambition. Now remember, he is writing this to people in the church. And so even I have got lost in what I was trying to talk myself into called holy ambition. They say like, no, I'm doing this for the church. But really what I love about this is when I found envy in my life, I realized, okay, wait a minute. I'm comparing my life to what James is saying here. And I think I might be out of line here a little bit. Because here's the thing. The language in this, uh, this passage right here is, I think, speaking towards gaining uh, politicking or gaining power or keeping power. And this is causing fights and strife in the early church that's forming right there. I think it's very interesting that some of the same things that we are still going through today, 
was happening back then, reminding me how true this word was for them then and how true it is for us now. Am I right? And I'm just encouraged slash disappointed that God, I'm encouraged that God has this word for us, but at the same time, let's dive into this a little bit more and just do, just do a little bit better maybe. Second child too here. Sorry, let's little jump in as well. I think also as I read this, I, I realized that as we talk about the early church and strife and arguing in the early church, some of you guys can relate to that all too well from past church experiences you've been in. And I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, I'm sorry. I know that it's difficult to be in a place where you see that happening in a church, especially around people that you love. But that same commentary went on to say this. I want to, I want to read it to you of maybe what was happening there. It said, selfish ambition is the desire to live for oneself and no one or nothing else, only for what a person can get out of it. In an attempt to persuade others, the person may lose their sense of reason and become fanatical, having confidence in only their own knowledge and arrogantly lords it over others. Such a person should not brag about being wise, for that is the worst kind of lie of all. And, then, and I want to go back to the original moment that this probably happened, this selfish ambition happened. I think it happened with Adam and Eve in the garden. We have this moment where we see perfect unity, the thing that we're all striving for with Jesus, with Adam, Eve, and God. It's amazing. They're in this perfect paradise where they can communicate and easily hear back and forth. And God says, you can have whatever you want in this garden. You can eat from any tree that you want. Just don't eat from this one. Just don't eat from this one tree and you'll be all right. And I think it was in this moment that earthly desire seeped into Adam and Eve where they started really looking at that fruit and like, that looks like the best fruit from that tree that I'm not supposed to eat. That just looks so good. It just looks so much better than everything else around it. I just want that so much more, which I think led to something unspiritual, which was now it's in their mind, it's in their soul. And I think at some point it's like, what is God hiding from us from not eating that? I think God would want me to eat that. I think, I think God is, for some reason, maybe that's the test. And I think they allowed some unspiritual thoughts and ideas seep into their mind, which ultimately led to demonic, and that they were encouraged and deceived by a serpent saying that God is hiding something from you. God doesn't want you to know you should have this fruit. Eat it. Enjoy it. And in that moment, when they plucked that fruit and they ate it, that is when their own desire, they chose their own selfish ambition and desire over what God wanted for them, and they denied the truth that God told them. And the separation between us and God was broken in that moment, and sin entered the world. But I think it could actually get worse, because in that moment, separation between us and God happens. Sin enters the world. God says, you are no longer to live in this garden. You have to go out, and I'm going to make child labor really uh, painful, and you're also going to have to till the ground, and it's going to be really, you're going to have to sweat and hurt and go through pain in order to grow food anymore. And imagine if someone is out in this field, and they're working, and they have blisters, and they're just battling the thorns, and they're trying to grow up all these crops forever to eat, and Adam walks by and just goes, hey, let me tell you about this awesome thing I did back in college where I ate this fruit I wasn't supposed to. Hey, you should have seen the parties that me and Eve used to have, and we ate this fruit, and it wasn't supposed to, it was awesome. Imagine being in that moment, and someone is boasting about that moment in their life where they just completely and utterly denied the truth of God in their life. And I just want to encourage you right now, I work in the student ministry world, and I can tell you students are confused by the stories they're hearing from Christians about how good the life of denying God looked like at one point in their life. Because somehow, some way, we, live, we leave out the part of when it burned and crashed and we realize that God was so much better. Am I right? And so I'm just telling you, that, that, that pride or whatever is the worst kind of thing to have whenever maybe we talk about things that denying the truth of God. It starts with earthly desire, moves into unspiritual thoughts and ideas and, and thinking, and then eventually even can move into the demonic where it doesn't take a long Google search to realize just how far you can go and who is leading us there. A little side note, the devil's mission statement's in the Bible. He's seeking to destroy and devour. And that, that he's trying to lead as many people in that direction as he can, which brings disorder in every evil practice. Once again, 
this is also being brought into the early church that James is talking to, the letter that he is writing. Someone is reading this. And once again, I'm going to go back to that commentary again and, and read what it says. It says, the quarrels and fights that James observed still characterize the life and the body of Christ and seriously hamper the effective communication of the gospel. Outsiders who look to the church as a place of solace and salvation often find it full of strife. We desperately need God's wisdom in our churches. And if we desperately need God's wisdom in this church, we need to seek and search for it. And that isn't talking to me up on the stage. That is talking to us as a church. It takes all of us, every single one of us, to seek and search for godly wisdom every day, all day. Because here's the thing. I am going to struggle, and one day I'm going to need you. And there's a truth there that where you might be struggling, and one day you might need me or the person sitting next to you. But I just want to encourage us this morning to do this together as a church to seek and understand what it means to be godly wisdom. And let me tell you this. I tell this to the students all the time. If we are trying to figure this out now, and they were trying to figure it out during the life and time of Jesus, and all of people throughout history was, the Bible has something to say about it, right? The Bible, God is not going to leave us in a place where we have to go try to figure out this on our own. And today, we get to see how God uses James to give us the outline of what godly wisdom looks like. And we're going to jump into that here in James in verse 17. It says, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. If you have your Bible or Bible app, I just want to encourage you to highlight these different parts because there are going to be moments in your life where you need to compare what you are going through to make sure that your emotions and spirit is in line with which side. So I would encourage you to, like, to, to highlight the word pure. And it says, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. So let's break this down. Godly traits. First and foremost, godly wisdom is pure. It is when people are actively searching for God. I, I'm looking to you to guide my thoughts. Understand me. I have no agenda other than what you want for me in my life. So godly wisdom, there's not an age requirement. It doesn't matter who you are, male, female, or where you're at in life. People with pure intentions that are trying to grow closer to the Lord can give us nuggets of this godly wisdom as he puts it on them. Godly wisdom is peace-loving. Heavenly wisdom fosters peace and harmony in relationships. It seeks to resolve conflict, not avoid conflict, resolve conflict. Here's what I'm going to ask you. Before you say something, ask yourself this question. Is this going to add fuel to this already tense and tension of bait that's going to get people more riled up? Or does this have a chance to bring some peace to where we can continue this conversation where we can possibly help them see the truth of Scripture. I had a friend, uh, he was in the Boy Scouts, and he was saying when he was in the Boy Scouts, there was two campfires typically when they went on these trips. There was kind of like the Boy Scout fire, then there's like the dad fire off to the side. He was having a hard time with um, some knots or something like that, and he was over on the dad's side working on something at this campfire, and he could hear political talks start coming up. Now, this is a long time ago. I can't even remember what it was. It's not recent, but it's just so funny to me when I realized, like, man, it was going on then and it's going on now. And I don't know about you, but when political talk comes up around a, when a circle of people, I get uncomfortable, all right? I can feel it in my stomach. I get tense. I'm like, oh, no, somebody's going to say something, and, and I think I know what I believe, and they're gonna, I don't have to take sides, and they're going to be upset. And he said as he was hearing this political talk happen, Finally, the one dad who was kind of getting it going just goes, I wish I could just line them up on a wall and just shoot them down. And it's like, oh, I could just picture myself there just being like, oh, that's so heavy. That is, oh, like, you know what I mean? I'd be so uncomfortable. He said another dad was there, kind of slight, a little bit even smaller. And he looks over at him who just talked about shooting his political rivals. 
and says, hey, can you hand me a drink out of the cooler? And as the guy gets the drink and hands it to him, he says, as, as the moment that he went to grab the drink, he just says, hey, I actually used to feel that same way too. And he said this silence fell under, this, this moment of everyone going, what's going to happen next, <laughs> right? And the guy who just made that big, bold statement just goes, what changed your mind? And he said, as a young man, I got to see an actual conversation happen in front of me that, that stayed peaceful. And he said, that young man got to drive home with the dad who asked that good question. He said, hey, how did you bring about that? How did you know what to say in that moment? And the dad who brought, that, brought in that moment just said, hey, you know what I've learned? I've learned that when people feel something really big in their life, when they have just big feelings and high emotions, it's a weight that's sitting on them. And he goes, well, I've learned that when I shoot to try to take all of that weight off in one sentence, or I try to bring all these things in one paragraph that's just going to lift it all off them at once, I've learned when I try to carry all that weight at once and take it off of them, it not only hurts me, but probably hurts them as well in the process. So I just simply see as a weight that's on them, and I try my best to take a little bit of that weight off a little bit at a time, not only for me to carry some of it, but they still need to carry some of it as well for them to come to their conclusion at the end. Not avoiding the conflict, but talking and speaking in a way that allows both of them to work through it. And honestly, James talks about it. He says it's being considerate. He says, be considerate of where they're at. Be considerate of their story. Be considerate of maybe where they're coming through because there might be a bigger weight there that you need to take off piece by piece in order to get to the deeper issue. And that's really hard because he's also saying you have to be submissive to hear them out sometimes. You have to also listen to respond, not have a response and just wait for your turn to, sh turn to shoot back. It's, what he's basically saying in submissiveness is you got to love the person more than loving to win the fight. And that's where I think godly wisdom comes from because it's full of mercy. Now, everything I'm saying here is not me. This is just coming straight from James right now. I'm just reading off the list that he gave us. He says, when, you're, when you do these things, it will bear good fruit because you're going to see it in the relationships and their lives. It will be impartial and sincere And this is something that we talked about in James chapter 2. I highly encourage you to go back to our YouTube channel and watch that sermon because it's going to bring another level of understanding of what James is trying to do here in chapter 3. He goes, but really, it's going to be a, you're going to be a peacemaker. You're going to allow for, for us to talk through these things and ultimately give them the truth that we cannot deny. And I love this so much because all James is doing is repeating what he heard Jesus talk about. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, 8, and 9, James is just repeating Jesus' words when Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And we find ourselves at this moment where, where James is comparing and contrasting the two types of wisdom. So check it out. Here's the two lists. We have worldly wisdom and we have godly wisdom. On the worldly side that James lists out, he says, it has bitter envy, selfish ambition, denies the truth. It's earthly, unspiritual, demonic disorder and leads to every evil practice. On the godly wisdom side, we see pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, good, bears good fruit, impartial and sincere, and is a peacemaker. And when we look at this list... And I would say, hey, what type of person do you want to deal with? The worldly side or the godly side? We all know which side we want to deal with. But the truth is, all too often, we try to jump from one to the other in our own life. We try to jump to the worldly wisdom in our work life, but godly wisdom in our home life. We try to jump to worldly wisdom with our road rage, but godly wisdom in our relationships with our family. Right? We want to stay in both of these camps more often than we honestly should. And that's why I'm going to encourage you, compare your life to this list and not the other people you're thinking about right now. Because this is what I mean about what, what James does for me is just this moment of like, okay, where am I at on this list? And, and do I know if I'm aligned with God? Because I said earlier that we've kind of been leading up through James chapter 1, 2, and 3. 
And we're about to get to chapter four now, which is going to change a little bit more to that second child directness. In chapter, we said earlier, I started off with saying a devoted follower of Jesus should stand confidently, serve compassionately, speak carefully, should be what God wants them to be, do what God wants them to do, and speak as God wants them to speak. But now we're going to add the fourth thing, which is to submit to God, to actually submit to what he wants. Because I'm going to tell you right now, that godly wisdom side is impossible to gain if we are not daily, actively submitting to what God wants for us. We will always be jumping back and forth until we, as all of us together, are encouraging us, supporting each other, and being there for us with godly wisdom. Because here's why. Oh, I'm, I'm skipping ahead. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm getting too excited. See, I just, <laughs> I just love this so much because I, it's just this moment in my own devotion where I can say, okay, God, where am I? He says, Submit yourself to God. And once again, in chapter four, verse one, he starts with a probing question that he's gonna give us the answer to. He says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your own desire that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask. When you ask, you do not receive, because when you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasure. Man, second child harshness. Like when Kinsley came in the room and said, Dad, those shirts are just getting too tight on you. You need to get bigger ones. (laughs) It's hard to hear, but a little bit of truth there, right? Because what he's saying is simply this. Stop and think real quick, because you guys are fighting, most likely, about religious legalism, versus faith in God through a relationship of Jesus Christ. You guys are fighting about non-essential things that's going to allow you to have a relationship with God. And I'm going to tell you right now that it's actually more in you than in them. Because he says it right there. He says, uh, he says in verse 2, you desire but new, do not, oh, I'm sorry, Verse one, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from the desires that battle within you? Saying there's an inner turmoil in you that is overflowing to the people around you. And and they're fighting and they're going through this. And he just wants them to take a time to pause and think and take a breath. He's saying they come from your own desire and that's what's coming out. And we see in James chapter one, We talked about this a little bit already. And I'm going to jump ahead to verse 15 in James chapter 1, verse 15, when he says, Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. And now he's just bringing it back up in chapter 4 because he's saying, Your own inner anguish that you haven't dealt with is causing a lot of fighting and argument around people, and they're not finding Christ because of that. So once again, he brings up a, a list that we can follow. He says, he says, first of all, ask yourself, is this selfish ambition or bitter envy? And like I said earlier, I remember there's been times in my life where I tried to convince myself it was holy ambition. But when I realized how much envy was in my own life, that is when I realized I got to go back to the drawing board here and allow God to work in me before I continue down this path of frustration He says, it's going to bring coveting and greed. First of all, I want what they have, so now I'm going to store up everything that I can in order to use it against them. I think sometimes he's actually, I think it's because he's talking to the church, he's talking to people who had big relationships with each other, and he's actually saying, you know what your greed is right now? Is all the stories that you're going to use against them in the next fight. That's actually what you're storing up here. That's that's, That's what Matt thing, and that's what I think is happening there. He's saying, look, you're going to be stealing and fighting, Stealing, cutting corners, doing whatever you got to do, but it's going to lead to fights. And then all of this is because you're actually, you're having improper prayers. Your prayer life is not aligned with what God wants for you. Because right now you're asking God to help you with your anger because you just want to win more fights. You're not asking God to help you with your anger because you want to try to help more people find him. 
right now you're asking God for these things because it's just trying to, you're trying to be seen in a certain way versus what, how God wants to see you. And so I want to encourage all of us this morning that the prayers and the time we spend with God, that if there is moments where you do not feel like they are being answered, keep digging deeper to what God wants you to learn about where you're at in life than anything else. They say, I mean, I've been in this for a long time. I don't understand. I think that God has something more for you. And he just wants you to, his heart and your heart to align a little bit more. Because James does talk about this in James chapter 1, verse 5. James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generous, generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you. I truly believe that God just wants you to go a little bit deeper. The greatest and ultimate example of heavenly wisdom, not making any sense to the world, was the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. People try to use the worldly wisdom to stop Jesus, and they would have done anything for Jesus to use worldly wisdom to fire right back at them. In the time Jesus was put in front of a guy named Pontius Pilate, and Pontius Pilate was not an idiot. He was a ruler of a large region. He moved up the ranks. But Pontius Pilate did not have what Jesus had, and that was Pontius Pilate did not have heavenly wisdom on his side. So he thought, if I just barter for the life of Jesus, then people will be convinced. If I just release this criminal, I'll give him a choice. Jesus or this criminal? The people still choose the criminal. Okay, got to go back to worldly wisdom again. This time he's going to use, I'm going to use torture, and I'm going to whip and beat Jesus in order for them to see that he's been properly punished. Worldly wisdom didn't work again. All right, I washed my hands of this. What better way to stop this than to kill him? Put him up on a cross, let him see him die, and then everything will die down. But little did they know that Jesus had so much more than any worldly wisdom could ever have. He had heavenly wisdom and godly wisdom on his side. It was pure to be honest with Pontius Pilate when he needed to be in the room. It was Full, it was submissive to the father when the father said, you're going to be beaten and tortured. And he said, okay, God, your will, not mine, mine done. It was full of mercy and grace on a cross, taking on all the sins and the death for people, even when they deserved justice for killing an innocent person. He said, I'm still full of mercy and grace. And let me tell you something. It takes godly, heavenly wisdom and the example of what Jesus Christ did for us to know that we have that same power in us today. That we can and have to strive to seek that level of heavenly wisdom that even Jesus had in that moment. As I read through Jesus's life, there's story after story after story of people trying to use worldly wisdom to stop something from happening and Jesus going, don't you just learn your lesson? I got this heavenly wisdom that I'm gonna give to you and that we all have to this day. So now I'm gonna go second child on you and I'm gonna give you four things that I think are pretty simple that we can all do together today. And if we leave this building and we all do these things, I think you will start seeing what heavenly wisdom looks like. First is really profound and really deep. It's just simply seek godly wisdom. And by that, I just mean, let's start praying. Let's start praying. Not like the prayer before a meal or prayer before you go to bed. I'm talking about the decisions in your life, asking God, what do you want me to do next here? God, I have some relationships in my life and I need your wisdom on how to go there. So let's start praying and seeking God every day to what he has for store for us. If you're uncomfortable with praying, it's a weird, sometimes hard thing for us to do as believers, come on the 28th to our prayer night and just be around people who are doing it. And I think that will be, make a big difference. Pers number two, pursue purity and peace. Pursue understanding what God has for us to know through his word. This is where it's going to come from. Pursue what he has for us to, to be the people that he wants us to be. And I can tell you, there is a way to do it in peace that will allow us to have those conversations with the people around us. Number three, reject worldly wisdom. Yes, you have your friends, but are they praying and are they in this word that's giving you the advice? That's the question I have for you. Yes, you have some people who are speaking into your life, but let's make sure that these are people who love God and love you enough to give you what God is doing in their life and in through the word. Reject worldly wisdom. And then pray with preparation. Know going into your prayer life 
that it might be time for you to be submissive to what God has for you because I will tell you this, it doesn't always make worldly sense. But I can promise you, if we follow the example that Jesus set for us, it is what changes the world around us. It what changes our hearts, our motives, and our community. With that, let's pray. God, just thank you so much that first and foremost, you have a relationship with us that even makes this possible. I pray that we humbly come before you as a church that is devoted to following you in everything that we do. God, I pray that you continue to work in our lives so that we we can live like Jesus, act like Jesus, and help others do the same. Guide us in that pursuit of what it means to have heavenly, godly wisdom in our lives and all things that we do. God, thank you so much for what you're doing here. Guide us and lead us. In Jesus' name, amen. We do have our prayer night. It's on the 28th. We'd love to see you here. God bless. You're dismissed. Thank you.